your Bibles with us to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We want to read verses 20 and 21. We have some kind of carryover thoughts from our Sunday school lesson and our message this morning. We want to share with you, and there were some thoughts that I had, uh, some points I wanted to make, and this doesn't exactly have a three-point outline, whatever, you're just kind of connecting some thoughts together. So I'm going to dispense with that slide when it comes to the outline and uh, scriptures used this evening. But uh, I had some initial thoughts, and then as I was looking for a verse to, uh, you know, the scripture, I had several scriptures in mind, but which one to use as our text and starting point. And when I did that and tried developing my thoughts, it took me a little while to get from that starting point to my original point that I wanted to make. But anyway, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20 and 21, he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. So, taking our thought from verse 20, and science falsely uh, so called. And I'm just going to leave that screen up. Paul admonishes Timothy here in our text to keep that which was committed uh, to him. And I believe he's referring to uh, the scriptures, the Word of God, uh, chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, he says, Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. And so this gives us a, a, an understanding of what of the context here and what Paul said to Timothy. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, uh, Paul uh, says to Timothy uh, that uh, verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own law shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And so we see that which Timothy was charged to keep, that had been committed to his trust, was the scriptures, the teachings of the word of God. Uh, those things that he had been taught. Now, one of the things that we see from the scriptures that Satan has from the beginning endeavored to undermine our confidence in the authority and accuracy of the scripture uh, from the Garden of Eden. And there are several points, several scriptures I've used recently, I used in our Sunday school, I touched upon this morning, and no doubt I will use many times again in this lifetime, uh, but they, they bear repeating and they bear us remembering of these verses and how uh, Satan operates. But Genesis 3, 1, 
when Satan came to Eve in the garden and he said, Hath God said? He spoke to her, Hath God said? And he quotes part of what God said, but not all of it. And, but that phrase, Hath God said? is constantly thrown at, at us as believers by the world, by our friends, by our neighbors, by teachers, by different ones, people we work with, relatives, whatever. And it'll question, you know, if you have a verse of Scripture and you quote some Scripture, did God really say that? Is that what He said? Or they'll question, what did that mean? What did he mean when he said that? Is that what he meant? The questioning, and to get you to question what God has said. And that's just as true today as in the garden and in the days of the apostles. That men question and undermine our confidence and the confidence of believers in the authority and the accuracy of the Scripture. Now, in our text, Paul also admonished Timothy to avoid some things, as well as keeping that which he was to keep, which had been entrusted to him. And he said, avoid profane and vain babblings. Uh, an interesting uh, phrase and we see that in 2 Timothy 2.16 uh, when he said here study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth verse 16 but shun profane and vain babblings for they increase unto more ungodliness this is a phrase that Paul used uh, several times and the idea of profane something that is profane a lot of times we think of common or worldly it's common to the world and it comes from from what I was studying a the uh, a word that's associated with the idea of the threshold the door and and kind of crossing outside uh, or something coming from outside the threshold, the other side of the threshold. And so from the Jewish perspective, in their minds, it had the idea of that which pertained to the heathen, you know. Um, and so the word profane has the uh, connotation then of something being worldly or the of the heathen. And vain empty or fruitless. So profane and vain babblings or discussions uh, about things. Uh, he said to avoid. And let us kind of just understand a simple fact that the perspective, the world view of the unbeliever is going to be very different from the perspective and worldview of a believer. And it shouldn't be too hard to understand and grasp that, that, that fact. That their perspective, their worldview is going to be very, uh, very different. And uh, the conclusions that they come to, therefore, because of their perspective, because of their worldview, their conclusions about life and different things is going to be very different. <coughs> And, and Paul, uh, I think, touches upon that in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, when he says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he goes down this list of these different relationships that we have in the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. And so to avoid certain entanglements uh, and relationships uh, to the world and to the unbeliever and to... Uh, the loss and the entire way of thinking. And he says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. 
And so, uh, he also said in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, and he's discussing the resurrection there, and verse 32 and 33, a perspective, if a person's worldview, there is no God, there is no life after death, there is no judgment, then eat, drink now while you're alive because tomorrow you die. And this was kind of the philosophy of those who have fought in the arena. You know, so today while you're alive, eat, drink, be merry, enjoy the, the life because tomorrow you're going to die and it's all over. There's nothing after that, so enjoy what you have right now. Because there is no resurrection, there is no afterlife. You see how that affects our worldview and the conclusions we come to. And Paul said, if that is true, then we as believers have all been most miserable. Because our worldview is such that we uh, hold back ourselves. We uh, are temperate. We're moderate in our uh, behavior. And, and we have a worldview that sees that the things done in this life, we're going to have to give an account for. And uh, there is a life after death. There is a resurrection. So our worldview and our conclusions are, are very different. And, and that, that idea then that the lost have a world, and, and so their reasoning, their line of thinking, their discussion... Paul refers to it as profane and vain babblings. Heathenistic and empty and fruitless discussions. Uh, and he said to uh, avoid these things. And the other thing that he said to avoid, and this is getting more to our point, but how this ties in is oppositions of science falsely so-called. It's not that, if you understand, science simply means knowledge. The word, the Greek word that is translated science simply means knowledge. And we believe God is truth. His word is truth. That which is true is knowledge. Knowledge is truth. Truth is knowledge. And, and you look at the, the Proverbs and how it exalts wisdom, knowledge, understanding. These things are to be sought after. And we gain those things from the Scripture. And as we're taught of the Holy Spirit and we're taught of the Word of God, we gain wisdom and we get understanding and knowledge. And so there is no conflict. There is no opposition between truth and knowledge. But that which claims to be knowledge falsely claims to be knowledge or falsely claims to be truth. Now there's a problem between truth and that which is falsely called truth. And uh, that's what Paul is talking about here, that oppositions of science falsely so-called. And so, reasoning and things which are not genuine science. Evolution is not science. Evolution is a belief system. Now we have been bombarded, brainwashed, to accept evolution as science. It's not science. It is a belief system because it involves things which cannot be observed, which cannot be demonstrated, which cannot be proved by experiment and 
uh, uh, repeatedly, which is the scientific method. You observe things, you make up a, a, uh, a theory or something based on what you observed, and then you experiment to see if you can prove it. And the only way you can prove it is by being able to repeatedly have the same outcome. That you, you test your theory. Well, when it comes to origins, the origin of the earth, the origin of man, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, you can't observe it. It's, there's not, it's not occurring in a way that you can observe as to the origin of it. And so they have a belief system that deals with origins. It's a belief system that is founded upon the principle, no God, there is no God. And they've tried to establish a system to explain all of these things that leaves God out of it. And you need to understand that from the get-go. Evolution says no God. There is no God. So, a belief system, a worldview of those who have said in their hearts, no God. Psalm 14 Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, almost word for word. But it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And it goes on to say, they are corrupt. They are corrupt. Their thinking is corrupt. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And it repeats the same thing in Psalm 53 verse 1. Now when you read in Romans chapter 1 verse 8 to begin with verse 18 uh, you, um, it says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness or the, the word there, to hold down, to suppress. They're not holding it up. They're not lifting it up. They're holding it down or suppressing it uh, in unrighteousness. Um, because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. For God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of Him, again, you know, we touched upon that this morning, the invisible things of Him. God is spirit. He has no outward or visible form that we can uh, say, see, this is God, this is what He looks like. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world. It talks about the heavens. They declare His handiwork. The evidence is in the existence of all of these things. Uh, clear seeing, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And that's where these vain babblings come from. Their discussions, their train of thought, the things they say, he says it's vain, it's empty, it's fruitless. Um, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And so, those today who express this absolute belief in evolution, you talk to them, they think they're wise. They profess themselves to be wise. 
And if you don't agree with them, you're the one that's foolish. But according to the Bible, they're the one who are foolish. And it means because their foolish heart was darkened. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And so, that is the underlying principle behind evolution. Profess, when they knew God, the evidence is there, but they ignore it. Uh, Second Peter, uh, he says, the scoffers, they're willingly ignorant. They're willingly ignorant. They willingly ignore the evidence. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. They willingly ignore the evidence, and there is, and we'll, we'll touch a little bit upon some of that, but there is evidence that confirms the existence of God and the accuracy and the veracity of God's Word. Uh, so, what does this false science say that opposes the Word of God? Now, in, in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 is kind of a go-to portion of Scripture in dealing with evolution and that topic. Um, but again, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Uh, In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, it said, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and our Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? And we want to pause for a moment right there. Where is the promise of His coming? To the believer. Our comfort, our hope, our blessed hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ and that He died for our sins, that we have the forgiveness of sins, that we have everlasting life. And part of that promise that He made us in, in John there, He said, and if I uh, go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself. The 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is all about the resurrection and that is tied to His return, His coming, and we're going to be raised from the graves. Death hath no power over us. Uh, the, it has no ultimate victory over us. Life does not cease and end at death. And so, where is the promise of His coming undermines the Christian hope which is in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is in His uh, redemption and in the resurrection, which He has promised that He's coming again. And so, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. It's from the beginning as though it's still going on. And uh, the scientific term that is used that expresses this idea there, there actually the scientists or the evolutionists today actually say this it's called uniformitarianism and it's, it says that the, the, the things that we see the processes that we see right now that we can observe are the processes that brought all of this into existence. 
And the Bible says that's not so, first of all. And it's obvious that it's not so. The, what we're observing now is the ongoing and the maintenance of that which was created because we see nothing new actually being created. One of the laws of thermodynamics is that speaks of a finished or completed creation because there's no new energy being created. It may change forms, but it is neither destroyed nor created. And so uniformitarianism is a belief that the processes that we see now have continued from the beginning of the creation. The creation is still going on. And uh, what we observe, and so they try to measure certain rates, and certain things are happening at certain rates, so you look backwards. But there's a number of assumptions made on that. Uh, and number one, that's not what created and brought the heavens and the earth into existence. They have not been able to, you know, because science is, you, you have a, an idea, you have a theory, you're able to duplicate it. You're able to produce it. You're able to do it over and over again. They've never been able to produce life. They cannot take what they say happened and, and make it happen. It doesn't work. Because those processes, and the Bible says that, those processes are not the same. He said, and, and so it goes on to say, for this they're willingly ignorant of. And it talks about the creation by the word of God. The heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And they're ignorant of the flood, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And so these two uh, great events, they deny. They deny a worldwide flood. And they deny the creation, a literal six-day creation. And so, as we uh, look at this, the Genesis account of creation says that God created the heavens, the earth, and everything that's in them in six literal 24-hour days. I said, well, that's just not possible. Well, not from their perspective or point of view, and not by the processes they observe today. No, it's not. But that's not how it came about. God said, and it was so. Ex nihilo, uh, out of nothing, from nothing. Uh, he created all things. The genealogical records in Genesis gives us an age for the earth and the universe of approximately 6,000 years to this, this point in time. Not millions of years. And so they, and actually when evolution first started to be taught, and they first started espousing this idea. It was uh, hundreds of thousands of years, not millions of years. And, and the more that they have been able to discover and learn, the more impossible they realize that was. And so they have to keep adding millions and millions and millions of years. And, and the age of the earth has grown uh, quite rapidly uh, in the process and that right there shows the, the fallacy of their base assumptions that they were off, that they were wrong. But the false science of the evolutionist says the earth must be millions of years old. And, and you just pick up any book, children's books. Children love dinosaurs. Children are fascinated with dinosaurs. I remember as a kid, I was fascinated with dinosaurs. And I remember uh, making a little uh, stegosaurus, this was one of my favorites to make, with the little plates on their back sticking up and the spikes on the tail. And, and I used to make them out of clay and, and different things. And, uh, and, and children, are like, they, they're fascinated, they're attracted to that. And so every children's book you pick up, the very first words, millions of years ago. Um, and 
the problem is that many professing Christians have given in to the pressure and have accepted the premise of the evolutionists that the earth is millions of years old. But there's a problem. Because the biblical account, an understanding if you take it as it says, the earth is only 6,000 years old. There's a big difference between 6,000 years and millions and millions of years. Big difference. And that's what uh, Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 6.21. Well, many professing, professing this false science. He's talking about believers. He said they've erred from the faith. When you accept the premise, you've erred from the faith. And that's, that's a serious problem because there are many Christians today. And there have been a couple of, and this was my original thought and point that I wanted to get to. There have been several, and two in particular, uh, that Christians have expressed to try and accommodate the biblical account of creation that God has created. And the millions of years of evolution that they say have to be there. And one was the day-age theory. And I don't know how many still hold to, to that. But the day-age theory was that the days in Genesis 1, you know, the first day, the second day, were not literal 24-hour days, but unspecified eons of time. And so they, they try to accommodate the millions of years by saying that those days uh, were just eons of time. And the genealogies were just, you know, they don't take them as literal, uh, but more allegorical and so on. But one of the things, even when you, you look at that and you take the, just the whole idea and, and you think about some of these things. You know, they say that amphibians developed because fish kind of crawled up out of the sea onto the land on their fins, and over time their fins developed into lakes. Now, any one of you kids know, you take a fish out of water and throw it up on dry land, what's it going to do? It's going to die. It's going to flop around because it can't breathe. It's not going to exist long enough to evolve into something that can breathe on the land. But that's what they say happened. The fish kind of crawled up and, and it then went back in the water and crawled. No, you take a fish and put it up on the dry land, it's going to flop around. He doesn't want to be on the dry land. You put him back in the water and he's fine. He's not going to cook. The fish doesn't come up on dry land of its own free will. Now, there are some fish that they, they show that will actually come up out of the water down in Florida, I think, and cross the roads and all. You know, why did the fish cross the road to get to the water that was on the other side, you know? Um, but it's a fish. It's not an amphibian. It's a fish. And, but this is, you know, one of the, the fallacies that how did these animals exist for the millions of years that it took them to evolve into something else so different that it could not exist in between. It couldn't survive in between. So the, the day-age theory and the order of events that the Bible gives, and the order in God created things, and the order that they say things evolved, and so on and so forth, it just doesn't add up. But another theory, which is rather common, is the gap, what is known as the gap theory. The gap theory says that there was a, a gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Uh, now let me read that. 
and see. And just reading it, do you see millions of years here? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was uh, without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day. And the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning was the first day. Now they want to put a gap between Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. And they say that the original creation that he created in verse 1 was destroyed by the fall of Satan. That first creation is when the dinosaurs lived. And that earth was destroyed because Satan sinned and rebelled and he was cast out to the earth and that brought about the destruction of the old earth. And so there's a gap of time in there of millions of years and then he started over again in verse 2. Now that's, that's really stretching. However, and I know Sister Jenny likes Schofield Bible. You look at your notes in Genesis. It subscribes to the gap theory. What is known as uh, dispensationalism or hyper-dispensationalism that is very common amongst them. I know some preachers that kind of hold to that. Uh, it is not necessary to accept the premise. The premise is false. And so, uh, I, I don't believe that there is a gap there. And, and here's why. Because according to that theory, you have sin entering by Satan's fall and bringing about destruction. When Romans 5.12 says, Sin entered the world by one man, and death by sin. Therefore death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Sin did not enter the creation until chapter 3. It did not enter in chapter 1. Sin entered because of the fall of man, not Satan. Satan was not given dominion over the earth. Man was. It was the man's sin that brought about the curse. Brought about the curse on the earth. There is biblical evidence that man and dinosaurs were contemporaneous and lived together on the earth. There is physical evidence in the fossil record that they lived together and were contemporaneous upon the earth. Uh, evolutionists don't want to admit that. There's a lot of evidence in the fossils, in the there's evidence of a worldwide flood, and in that evidence of a worldwide flood, it counteracts or counter uh, it counters the whole idea of evolution in the millions of years and the layers being laid down slowly over millions of years of time. Uh, those, those layers and the rock formations were laid down very quickly over a very short period of time as a result of a cataclysmic flood. Uh, that's why you have tree trunks standing vertical through several different layers. Those layers are sedimentary. Sediment is what is laid down in flood waters. Sediment is what is stirred up by the flood and then as the waters recede or slow down, those sediments begin to, to filter out and drop out. And anything floating there gets buried in those sediments. They were not laid over millions of years. That's why you can have a tree trunk that was ripped off top and bottom, standing vertical through many, many layers of different layers of sedimentary rock. There's just so many things out there that, uh, but 
Gap theory, I think it, it's false theology to go with false science. I don't ascribe to the gap theory. I, just, uh, uh, I, I believe, let me put it that way, instead of trying to get out the word ascribe, I, I believe in a literal six-day creation with no gap and that the genealogy is accurate. God said exactly what, what it was and that the earth is approximately 6,000 years old, not millions and millions of years. So, the whole premise of evolution is false and therefore is to be rejected. Uh, the earth is not millions of years old, and as I said, there is much evidence that suggests a much younger age for the earth. Um, such as oil and gas under pressure within the earth. Because the geologists know that, that study that sort of thing. The geologists that go out and study the rocks to find oil deposits. That those rocks and things, the pressure that the oil is under, the pressure the gas is under, uh, leaks off at a known rate. And if the earth has been here for even 20,000 years, that's far, far short of the millions of years that they say that we've been here. If that oil and that gas has been in the earth for more than 20,000 years, there would be no pressure. It would have, the pressure would have leached out through the rock. Because rock's porous. And the gases pass through it. And they know this. But they're not talking about that because that would say the earth is less than 20,000 years old. The Bible says it's 6,000. The oil and gas deposits are there. That is the result of the worldwide cataclysmic flood. That's how it got there. Coal is the plant life that was buried at the time of the flood. That is the vegetation of the pre-flood world. The oil, gas, is from the animal life that was buried. And well, possibly even the human life that was buried at the time of the flood. And their bodies decayed there under that pressure and with between the rock and that became oil, and that became gas. That is the result of the flood. And that's the very thing they said they're willingly ignorant of. Um, so, there are just too many theological issues with the gap theory. And, and another thing, that it is a field of study that we're just now really getting into more and more. And that's DNA. You know, and the Bible describes that back in the book of Psalms. David describes this. In Psalm 139, we should be familiar with the phrase, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 14, he says, I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. You know, David, just in considering himself and what a wonderful work and creation just the human body is. And he said, yeah, as he contemplated this, and, and understand too, David is a prophet. And he spoke under the inspiration of God. And God, you know, revealed these precious truths to him. And, and, and so he said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
He says in verse 5, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. Talk about when he was conceived. And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth or in the womb. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written. which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Talking about at conception and our members, our body parts, our hair, our eye color, our bone structure, all these things are written in our DNA. And as we develop and we grow in, in the womb, the continuance there. You know, and he said, this isn't hid from you. You know, he talks about, you know, we think about, he says that he's numbered the hairs of my head. We think, well, after I'm born and, you know, and, and he knows me. But he knew us before we were born, before we were conceived. And that DNA, and the more you study that DNA, that is the blueprint. And, and everything, it, it, the apple, the orange, the pear, the wolf, the dog, the cat, the horse, the human, our DNA that determines what we are. And the more they study it, it, it goes to prove more and more that we don't evolve our DNA. And you can have variations and mutations within a kind. And scientifically, observation. Over and over again, every mutation has been a defect and is not passed on necessarily. But there are, there are some things uh, that are passed on. There are things in our DNA that get passed on. We, we don't even understand it right now completely ourselves. But you cannot cross kinds with all the the things that come forth you have variations within a kind and that's one of the things you know the bible talks about kinds of animals kinds of things and the people say how can you get all those animals on the ark he didn't he only had to have a pair actually the clean there was seven pairs and of the unclean there was just the, the one pair uh, but you only need a kind. You didn't need every one of them, one of every kind of dog. You just need one, one pair of dogs. And they didn't even have to be the same kind, or I mean the same breed. But the, a dog is a dog. That's a kind. And a dog can mate with a dog, and they're going to produce a dog. Depending on the genes and the genetic, the DNA structure and how it pairs up, as to what its characteristics are, but it's still a dog. You have different kinds of cats, but they're still a cat. You have different kinds of breeds of horses, but they're still a horse, and so on. Uh, but you can't cross breed between kinds and perpetuate that because uh, the one is sterile. And you have to go back and, and continue to cross breed. And the mules are like that. A mule is a cross breed. They can't re uh, mules can't reproduce more mules uh, because one is sterile. And so that is something that is scientific. That's something they've proved. It's something they've demonstrated over and over again. Hybrids, which is crossing kinds, are sterile. That's, that's one of the problems with a lot of the hybrid grains and foods that we have. 
as uh, that you know used to. You grew a crop of corn, you could keep some of it and plant it the next season and plant more corn. But the hybrids, you can't do that. You have to go back and buy more seed each, each season to, to plant. You can't use what you planted this season because uh, that's a problem with the hybrids. Well, that shows that evolution cannot take place. Like that fish, the fish is a fish. It can't survive for millions of years on dry land in order to develop legs and lungs to be able to breathe out of the water. It is not going to happen. And uh, an animal that dies, I mean, our roads are littered with roadkill. Any, any of that going to become a fossil? No. Why? Bacteria, it deteriorates, it goes back into the dust. How are fossils produced? Not over millions of years, but very suddenly as they was buried in the flood under that sedimentary rock. They were buried alive. And they were buried together and many times. And that, that's what formed and preserved them. You know, uh, you can go down in Kentucky, Mammoth Cave, and they have a mummified Indian in there that was down there that was uh, collecting gypsum or something, one of the rocks fell on it. And he laid there for how many hundreds of years? And his body's still preserved because the conditions were such that it preserved his body. And mummified him naturally. So you have instances where that happens but normally, what happens, something dies, it deteriorates. It goes back to the dust. There's bacteria. Uh, God created the, the bacteria and things. Uh, so to take care of that and, and to dispose of dead bodies, and they deteriorate and they break down, they do not become fossils except in certain extreme cases. So the whole idea... Evolution. The scoffers questions God's promise. Where is the promise of His coming? His coming is the believer's hope. His coming is the scoffer's dread because He's coming in judgment. He's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man. And that is the real reason. You know, Satan's lie was kind of threefold. Hath God said, Thou shalt not surely die, and thou shalt be as gods. And so, man rejects the idea of God because he rejects the idea of being accountable to God for his behavior. Knowing instinctively I have sinned, I've done bad things, and God's not going to be happy with me. And so the way of dealing with it, you know, like even in, in modern psychology, a lot of times in dealing with problems, emotional problems, which has to do with guilt, deny that the, the action was wrong. Blame it on somebody else. Blame it on circumstances beyond your control. Don't own your choices and actions. Therefore, you get rid of the guilt, the feelings of guilt that way. But it's not going to change anything, really. And so that's the same idea on a larger scale where man, because he knows he's guilty before God, he feels guilty, he just denies there's a God. And convinces himself, therefore, there's no guilt. I have nothing to be guilty about because there is no God. There is no uh, lawgiver. There is no judgment. There is no life after death. There is no heaven. There's no hell. They don't mind the heaven so much, but they don't want to acknowledge hell, so they get rid of heaven also. Neither one exists. They deny all these things because at their core, they recognize their guilt. And 
that goes back to, to what Paul said there in Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now we'll talk about the scoffers, what? Walking after their own lusts. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the believer's hope and the lost person's dread. And it's kind of like the, the idea of just burying your head in the, in the sand and thinking, well, if I can't see it, I don't believe it there, then it doesn't exist. Uh, yes, it does. Your hiding doesn't make it go away. Your denying it doesn't make it untrue. And uh, but that is one of the things, the oppositions of science falsely so-called. And it goes right in there with the profane and vain babblings. It is from a worldview that has already said and made up its mind in their own heart, there is no God. So from a believer's point of view, one thing is why would you accept the premise as a believer? You believe in God, you believe the Scriptures. Why would you accept a premise that is based on no God? That does not make sense. Reject the premise. Anyway, let us... Get our Bibles then.